welcome to UAP channel. So I've created my Twitch account, UAPCH. If you want to check that out. Photography has made mind-boggling advances over the last century and a half. All right. So, okay, tin type um, is one way, but there are many others. And if you look at the quality of these old photographs, they rival today's photographs. I've seen some super duper HD ones. So many of us now have a camera in our smartphones, but so many of us now have a camera in our smartphones, but in a story that comes to us by PBS station Milwaukee PBS, one woman in Wisconsin has rediscovered the art of taking photographs and developing film using techniques from the mid 1800s. One woman. I love old cameras, old lenses. The one I use the most is an 8x10 camera from 1903 with an old portrait lens. She's one of these people who talks in a singing voice. It's kind of cool. I don't know if you know. It's a lot of old cameras. It's a lot of old. 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 It's a lot of old cameras. It's a lot of old cameras. These machines are really simple. Really, it's kind of just a box with a lens on it. So it's not a complicated machine at all. So maybe the chemicals are slightly more complicated. That's what's amazing about them. Even though they're so old, you know, I'm using them over a hundred years later. And I love that about them because most of our modern technology doesn't work after two or three years. That is correct. For example, the panorama I saw of San Francisco, which I'll show later a little bit more of that, is way better than these panoramas. <laughs> the first time I saw a tintype appearing in the fixer, I felt like I had seen a ghost. Really? I got goosebumps and I was just, my eyes watered because it was so spooky and so beautiful and I thought, how did that happen? How can this image be before my eyes? Which is something we don't think about when we're looking at images on a screen. So there's complete magic there. And I still feel that way every time I take a picture. I'm always surprised by what I see. It always turns out differently than I imagined. It's interesting that way. You know, it's, I don't want to sound like a hippie, <laughs> but the frequency stuff, um, frequency stuff is quite fascinating it, you know the way people exist as a living being you are electrical your soul is electric and so electrical uh, signals have a frequency <laughs> that dog and that frequency can be picked up by a certain instrument and if you eliminate different frequencies things can look a little different and I think there's a lot to that and how you see yourself, how others see you in person and how the camera picks you up, even in your appearance, though physically you haven't changed. Physically and chemically. The wet plate process is an old photographic method that uses wet chemistry to make an image instead of say film or negatives. I use aluminum plates and glass plates. So then I use a collodion, um, which is a liquid emulsion that I pour onto that plate, which becomes light sensitive through a series of chemical steps. It sits in a bath of silver nitrate where it becomes light sensitive in the dark room. And then um, I use developer that I make myself and an old varnish recipe that's a Civil War era recipe. This process really attracted me because it's a little bit unpolished. So the image is kind of messy, there's lots of artifacts that show up, little like smears, fingerprints, um, and I like the look of that. So she mentioned Civil War. Well, um, that's, well, I guess, yeah, these aren't Civil War. These are after the, that's after the San Francisco earthquake. Um, but I wanted to show the fact that these are stereo images. So they have, they're basically like 3D images. And um, that existed so long ago. You know, these are that earthquake was 1906. 
I really like photographing people. Someone by themselves is really like my ideal subject. I really like to be able to focus on every aspect of someone's face, lighting them perfectly, and then developing them perfectly. This process is fulfilling because it still really challenges me. I think because I have so much to learn yet, um, I'm still really hooked and um, it hasn't let me go, you know, because I really am challenged by it constantly and I want to master it. I think that's great. It's also interesting how that maybe this is a year old, I don't know. So let's say 2000, well, I'll just say 2019, whatever, it's close enough. In 2019, <laughs> that's some booty. In 2019, uh, we're profiling somebody who, whose favorite photography technique, photographic technique method is over 100 years old, and yet they are still learning it, and they're such of an expert that they make their living, apparently, doing portraits, and they're featured on national news, which is suspect. But in this case, um, I just think it's fascinating that for such of an old, I mean, how many technologies are out there that, that haven't improved much? And I'm just talking about the physical, you put up, you have that equipment, you have modern day equipment, and you have something in between, and you take a picture, okay, color, okay, I'll grant the color, but for a black and white or a sepia toned photograph, they really did a good job back then, I tell you. And it's a simple process, yet, She's still learning from the technique. I just, I, I can't get over that. That they, that they say it's a science that wasn't developed until 1830, 1829, some of the first. Um, but I think it was developed. I think maybe it was more perfected into an art over the latter half of the 19th, 19th century. So, they had um, a couple decades later, three or four decades later, I guess it was more of uh, five decades later, they were making movies that we know of. Um, I've conjectured before that they, they had movies uh, before that official time when movies started being made in the 1890s. Just like how the electric tram cars that we see in these photos. And why is that one blocked out like that? And that was odd. The electric tram cars went up with the buildings in cities that were scarcely populated at the time. And we have stereo image photographs of it. I mean, what does that tell you, folks? What does it tell you? I mean, the clarity of some of these and just the immense size of everything and I mean, look at that. Look at that gate. What what are those things for? I'm sure they have a story about it. Okay, this picture, the Sutro Baths interior, that sparked off something that you'll see in another video. Probably my next video. It's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Um, this Kakamini stories they tell. Kakamini. It's Kakamini. It just doesn't uh, hold water. That kind of looks like the Flatiron Building, but it's not. 24 hours before the 1906 disaster, earthquake, whatever the heck happened, uh, they have an aerial panorama that is so zoomable, it'll blow your mind. So I had to do a screen capture to demonstrate this fact. So this is after the 1906 earthquake and the people you see living uh, gathered on the beach or a few of them wandering around apparently right after the earthquake were able to clear all the debris off the streets um, and there are so few people compared to the structures we see that uh, it doesn't quite add up now I can imagine that most of them would have left I don't know how much time transpired between the uh, event, supposed event in this uh, photograph. But I wouldn't be surprised if this really represented the city 
um, almost as they found it. Um, you know, we did have the earlier photographs from before the earthquake, but uh, they don't look that different because you can tell that in this photograph from certain angles, from certain perspectives, views, and areas, you could take a picture that showed no damage. I mean, look at some of these homes have no damage. There's a sign of an earthquake in some of these homes, in some of these structures. Were they really built that differently? I don't think so. I mean, look how straight some of those walls are. I mean, they have concrete sidewalks. It looks like a car down there. It can't be. It's like a horse pulling a wagon. I don't know for sure. It's kind of blurry. I zoomed in on it before. It didn't really show anything. I mean, yes, there's some debris. But when I was looking at this, I thought, you know what? Okay, maybe there was an earthquake, sure. But, <laughs> you know, earthquake or no earthquake, it looked, there are photos that look like this of all these other cities. Maybe after a fire or maybe just without explanation. It's just the photos they took when they showed up or as recon when they scouted the city out. Because nobody was living there. They just pretty much found it. And they were the founders. And sometimes the cities were in ruins completely and sometimes the cities were just pristine totally intact this is mostly intact and uh i mean where did that rubble come from in down there on the street there was no building there there's a pile of dirt what are they playing at some of these fences some of the buildings themselves look very old there are windows that are boarded up shut those are not things you do when you build a brand new structure by hand. It's not like they're prefabs. Oh, well, this one comes with four windows out of the factory. Well, we only need three windows. Okay, so we'll just put a delete in there for one. You know, just we'll just panel that one up. Well, can't you just remove? No, the frames, the frames come standard. They're interchangeable, you know, reversible and all that. We don't want to add another part number. Oh, I understand. Okay. I mean, <laughs> no, it's not like Silas is going to... Uh, hand build it and say well i'm gonna frame up a window here and, and then i'm immediately boarding it up because that's cheaper than putting the window in you know i, I mean i guess theoretically yeah it could happen but what's the likelihood what's the likelihood just what's the likelihood that a town as little populated at the time would construct the buildings you see here built to last for so long uh, I mean there's I don't even really see much of a difference between these images before whether it's an earthquake sometimes or a fire or um, just when they find the city and somebody mentioned it almost looks like scale models and I can see that. I mean, there's a lot of detail, but it's it's possible. Kind of does have that effect sometimes. It depends on the... It's all in focus. I mean, what an amazing picture. Is this taken from a tower, a hill? Some of, Sometimes it's clearly taken from maybe a kite or a, or a hot air balloon or something like that. Who, who, if that's a flagpole, who puts the flag up and how and when and why? I mean, I swear, sometimes I just don't get what they're trying to do. This could be Rome. Look at that. I mean, think about it. San Francisco, Rome had thousands of years. San Francisco had six decades, each to get to the basically the same point. Uh, you know, give me 60 years and I can catch up with thousands of years of... Uh, building a, a, a capital city and, and San Francisco is not even a capital that we know of. I think maybe it was a capital of the previous civilization. And I'm not going to say Tataria because I don't know. I don't know that. But previous civilization, quite possibly. I mean, officially, yes, the Native Americans. I find it odd that there's really not much in the way of Native American input either way on this topic. 
I found some stuff about previous. It seems like this, whoever the people were that lived there in these stone buildings that existed were for the most part already gone before the Native Americans arrived, A, and then B, to answer the question, why didn't the Native Americans themselves live in the buildings, occupy them, and use them? Well, we don't know that they didn't, but we don't have any indi indication that they did. Um, it seems like they were just kind of, they kind of just stayed away from them, like off limits. They ignored it, you know, but I guess if they wanted to squat in a building somewhere, then it would make sense that they would do that. Um, you don't really hear about it, though. But then again, I've always wondered, where are the Native American structures? Because it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I've hesitated to think that it could be so different from what we've learned, but it, it doesn't... Okay, here's what I'm thinking. Native American cultures just on this continent, North America, they didn't build permanent structures for the most part. Why? Why this continent would it be that way? And then the other continents that have people are, uh, that we know of, that uh, people build permanent structures, live in them. I mean, it makes, it's an easier life to have a permanent structure. Why would it be that every single Native American tribe except for uh, what is it? Adobe or, well, Adobe, I don't know. The Sioux, I think Sioux, who, uh, lived in the, the cave, you know, the cave dwellers, whatever. Apart from, from those in Arizona, you know, we've learned that they all were migratory, transit, transient. And it doesn't make sense. I mean, yes, they made wigwams and teepees, but those were like roll up, roll up and move things. Well, they, don't you know they were hunter gatherer? Well, no, they were they had agriculture. Even if you're a hunter gatherer, moving around all the time just isn't isn't uh, as efficient. You know, it seems like some of them would would make forts and settlements and things. Well, the forts were already there. You know, I think I think there was a lot of squatting going on, and it just didn't really get documented. But I'm curious. You know, among the um, I know there are quite a few Native American uh, subscribers who may have some input on this, I'd like to hear about it, because it's very perplexing. I mean, I have heard from them a little bit, and they, they indicated that, you know, there's not a whole lot uh, of history about any pre-existing buildings of these types and sorts. But, uh, you know, for all the other reasons, I just, I don't see the pioneers coming and building, building up all these stone structures. There's too much weirdness. And I'm kind of frightened to think about, you know, the implications of what that means. Does it mean that the Native Americans who did have the uh, knowledge about it, what happened to them, you know? Well, it, I guess it can't be too much worse than what we already know happened. Or maybe it's not as bad as all that even, and that much of what we've been taught about history with respect to the Native Americans, is a false history. But I really don't think so. I mean, why would the Native Americans lie about their own history? And whenever it matches up with what the official story is, which you know is bullcrap, but where it matches the official story, I would put a lot of credibility towards that. But the official story tends not to mention, you know, genocide and unpleasant things like moving every single man, woman, child out. But um, the histories I've been reading, these accounts, you know, it definitely goes both ways. And I'll tell you what, I would be ready. It's fight or flight when you come across uh, natives. It was back then for the pioneers. At least, you know, in this territory, sometimes I wonder how much of it was just a hoax where it's like, you know, a bunch of Freemasons and theater makeup. And, you know, if, if you watch the TV show Lost and there were the others on the island, the others, the others, and uh, it was really cool, it was really mysterious, who are they, you know, they're on the other side of the island, they just very, they didn't talk very much, they seemed really rustic, but then sometimes they had some higher technology, and finally, uh, they, one of the people from the group followed them back to their hideout, and then snuck in there, and saw that they were using, like, theater makeup, you know, fake beards and mustaches, and 
and and like coal tar stuff to rub on their faces to kind of make them look like they've been living outside for a long time and that kind of stuff. I mean, look at look at all this stuff. Do you think people built all this? Pioneers. You know, you go from a log cabin to a, a 60 foot high domed ornate stone and marble building that's only three stories, four stories, you know, maybe 70 feet for four stories. Look at the balustrades on the street. It's like, is that for a horse and carriage? I mean, really? incredible and it, it's so empty such emptiness nobody's cooking there's no steam going up no smoke no nothing I guess this is before the earthquake huh? I misspoke earlier when I said it was after the, the the photograph is just amazing and it's not a super long exposure look the shadows aren't like moved around they're not blurred you know kind of an arc shape and I hope I'm premiering this live and I actually make it to the <laughs> premiere this time, not late. And I'm, well, I guess it is towards the end of the video, but it does any do, I'll just ask this because this is May, what, the third, 2019. Does, has anybody heard, noticed, seen, or verified something about the sun setting in a different location? Let me know. I'll tell you, I have noticed it's been going on a month or two now. I've noticed the moon looks like tilted or slanted or flattened and it's much higher in the sky than I remember it being like I don't remember the moon being directly overhead where I live it's very unusual I do not remember that I've never experienced the Sun directly overhead never lived that far south and I didn't think I was anywhere close to where I would see the moon directly overhead but I did I, I've seen it it's weird so anyway your thoughts on that thanks for watching age of photography well we don't know do we Catch you next time.